Hey folks, welcome back to another Dice Tower Preview. I'm Mark. And I'm Randy. Today we're taking a look at Castle Von Logan. Castle Von Logan is brought to you by Underground Games and Tangled Towers. It plays three to six players, ages 12 and up, and each game takes about one and a half to three hours to play. Great. Well, come travel with us through time where decisions are your ultimate weapon. Well, it was inevitable. Someone went and made a time machine, and of course, in doing so, broke time. You play the role of an agent from the future who is sent back to correct the mistakes and damage that the villain has created in the timeline. Castle Von Logan is a story-driven game with card-based combat. You can play cooperatively in story mode or semi-cooperatively in exploration mode. Although you travel as a group through the castle in its various timelines, each of you individually get to decide how you respond to the events you encounter. All right, this is a big sprawling game and we're gonna set up for story mode, but there's a lot going on here and we're gonna give you just kind of an overview of how it works. You're gonna take the main board, which is the green one, which is also the past, and you're gonna put it in the middle of the table. You're gonna take the health token and put it to 15, the clarity token and put it at 10. And then you're gonna find all the search tokens and you have red, blue, and green search tokens. You're gonna find the question marks and you're gonna put the corresponding colors two of each search token on the particular question marks of that color. Now there are three types of cards you'll want to set up around the board. And as Mark said, there are three different colored uh, question marks which represent different difficulties. Mm -hmm. There's the green question marks which represents basic level events. Blue question marks are a little bit more difficult right. events and red ones are the, the hardest yet. Very so, so these correspond to some of the card types we'll be talking about. In each case you want to keep the uh, colors of that particular card type mm. separate from the others. So first, we'll talk about the treasure cards. Yes. Uh, you want to uh, separate the cards by color if they're not already separated. You have your green, blue, and red treasure cards, as well as your violet treasure mm. cards, which uh, are for more advanced encounters. Yes. So you'll, you'll shuffle those and, and separately and put them near the board. You'll also do this with the various enemy cards. Again, green, blue, red, and violet. Uh, and then lastly, you have the event cards. You have first the story cards here, and you have your main story deck. And it's very key here because this is a deck you do not shuffle. Okay, it has, right. to, it has to stay in order. <laughs> it does. And you don't want to look at any of the cards in advance. In fact, there's a cover that says, do not remove this cover until the start of the game. Uh, this is a great thing about Castle Von Logan is the narrative here and the various kind of mm -hmm. choose your own adventure is key to this. The, uh, the cards are numbered. so. God forbid you actually stumble and, and, and <laughs> drop, drop them. them. Yeah, yeah, you can put them back in order, but you want to make certain you don't look ahead. Right. This, is, this is one you keep in order. However, you also have three other types of what they call random event decks. These are green, blue, and red, and they correspond with the events you'll be encountering on the board uh, where there are question marks of the same color. Mm -hmm. These you can shuffle, but each of these decks has a cover card. So you, what you'll want to do is you'll want to shuffle them without looking too closely at them. Keep them all face up. There's a uh, banner at the top so you can see which side is up. And you don't want to see the other side. So basically you can, you can mix them up as you choose. But when you're done shuffling them, you put this cover back on and uh, put them down here. When you draw from these decks, in general, you'll be drawing the bottom card because the order mm -hmm. is not important here. Right. But you'll draw the bottom, read the front, and then make your choices and look at the back. So you'll set up all these three types of cards around the board, and then you'll move on to setting up individual players. All right, now everyone takes a player board, and along with your player board, you're going to take damage tokens, you're going to take reward marker, and energy markers, and each of these player boards have special abilities specific to the character. You're also going to get your combat deck, also matches your color, and your decision cards that will aid you in making the story decisions. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting thing here is that, like Randy said, it is choose your own adventure. So everybody, though, gets to make a choice. Right. And you collectively work together through the consequences mm -hmm. of those choices. And we'll tell you more about that when yeah. we talk about the events phase. Now, also on the player, player map is at the bottom, you'll see where you'll be putting your gear and treasure cards and so forth. So you have your, your hands that you'll be filling with weapons or whatever you might be using. Mm -hmm. And you have your belt that looks kind of like a utility belt. Mm -hmm. And then you have on your back, which you're carrying back. So you might have a backpack, you might have like weapons or whatever. So lots of different options going on on this player map. And then you've got also the, the backpack here that holds uh, six, six small, small items, items on the right side. Right. 
So once you've set up everything and are ready to play the game, the next thing you need to do is give the leader token to one player. Now this will rotate throughout mm -hmm. the game, so you're not committing one player to be the first player every the round. Time, yeah. But we'll give it to Mark this time. So he's the leader, and he can break ties and circum circumstances. Yes, I can. Then you take the group token, and this represents where your team is in the castle yeah. as a group. Now there are opportunities to, for individuals to, to run off and sneak, sneak away. Sneak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those are brief little tiny missions. Right. In general, though, your trap. This indicates where your group is, and so set this on the pod ship shown in the lower right of the map. Your and time travel pod. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's how you've arrived. And then you remove the cover from the main story deck and read the read intro the here. Read there's the story. quite a bit of story here. There's a lot of story. Yeah. In fact, um, in story mode, I guess we'll jump a little bit ahead. In story yeah. mode, the way you complete the game is you get through all the events Indeed. in this deck. But yep. we'll tell you more about in-game conditions in a bit. So once you've done that, every player will get to... We'll get to choose, but let's tell you about how each round of Castle von Logan works. All right, so the game is played over a series of rounds, and each round has six phases. The first phase is move. You're going to move around the castle, outside it or inside it, until you hit a room with a question mark, and then you have to deal with that room. Now, those question marks determine what kind of event you're going to encounter. As we said, right. they range from green, easy, Me through too. blue, and up to red, very difficult. Where you just run away. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's... Well, you might have that choice. We'll right, talk right. about that during the event phase. There is also the option, in some cases, to... Uh, perform a turn or complete mm -hmm. a turn in a room where you've previously completed an event. Right. And that's shown by a, a what they call a clean, clean token mark, yeah. that, that's obscuring the question mark. But when you do that, you have a much more limited set of, of options right. uh, because you've already encountered the event there. The next phase is the event phase. And what you do in this phase depends on whether or not you've in, you're performing the turn in a room with a question mark or in a room with a clean token. Right. If you're doing a, uh, performing the turn in a room with a clean token, you don't do the event phase. But if you're in any other room, what you'll do first is you'll check the condition on the cover card of the main story deck. Now, there's not always a, a, a cover card on here, but if there is, you'll check to see what, whether you've met this condition. condition. If you have, then you will proceed to do an event in the main story deck. If you haven't, then you will perform a, a random event right. from the appropriate color deck. If you're in a green room with a green question mark, you'll choose one from the... Uh, from the random event deck that's green. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you'll pull one from the bottom rather than immediately below the cover. Now, the great thing about these events uh, is that there is typically some narrative at the top. Well, actually, we we're not going to show this just in case you guys zoom yes, in and spoil, the, spoil that secret. Because there's huge secrets. It really is. There are. There yeah. are. And, and let me tell you the type of, of things you're going to encounter. So at the top part, there's a narrative here. Mm -hmm. and it explains what you've encountered when you've gone into that room or that location. And then below that, there are four choices. And each player has a set of four cards with uh, the appropriate colored back for their player. And what they'll do is they will choose amongst the various options. Now, I'm not going to tell you specifically because, we, again, we don't want to spoil anything, but let me give you an example. Okay, okay, I'm going to interrupt Randy right there. Now, Randy had a great example that he made up on the fly for the story, but since we recorded this, the publisher has stated that the story bits that we have are strictly for the prototype, so I can spoil some story stuff. So I'm going to give you an example of what an actual story event is like. So the cover card for this says, Remove this cover when you have completed two random events during the next event phase. Resolve the event card under this cover. So you flip it over and you meet Princess Scala. So at the top of the story card, you'll see the title, which is Princess Scala, and the, the, the story description and then the choices below. And then on the flip side are going to be the results of those choices and then an event ending, which affects the whole group. So in this particular story for Princess Scala, the room is in darkness except for a single beam of moonlight streaming down from the ceiling high above. In its light hangs a swing made of flowery vines on which is seated a regal young woman. Her face is partially hidden by a large hat. She beckons to the group, inviting you to approach the chairs surrounding her swing. Don't just stand there staring. Come closer. There's so much I want to ask you. Me? Oh, don't mind me. I'm just waiting for my father to come and listen to my song. But you know what saddens me? He's not coming, ever. I've been waiting here for such a long time. I've become slightly bored. Oh, all right. More than just a bit 
extremely bored. Come, why don't you have a seat and listen to my song? Now, the choices you have here are A, you walk closer and take an empty chair. B, you walk toward her to attempt to arrest her. C, you decide to activate your suit's night vision feature and you pay two energy. And D, you decide to stay back in case there's any trouble. Now, all the players get to make their choices individually here. And then there's consequences to these choices. So on A, you uh, nothing happens. You're all good to go. And on B, you would lose a hit point. On the C choice, you have uh, initiative for the next round. Randy will tell you about that in a sec. And then D, uh, if C was activated, you also have initiative if nothing happens. So initiative was one of the two things that can happen and overwhelmed is the other. Again, Randy's gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And then finally you have the event ending, which affects everybody. And in this case, enough. You are no more entertaining than those clowns my father sends me. Find me if I hide. She spins her hat and teleports out of the room, lighting it up in the process. A couple of beings that had been hidden in the shadows steps forth and confronts the group. Now you summon two enemies or three, depending on the player count in the game. Logically. And there yep. are two different conditions you can have as you enter the next phase. Uh, one of them is overwhelmed, and one of them is you have, I think it's initiative or something yeah. like that. And uh, these make a difference in how you approach the first round of combat. We'll talk about that in a second, though. But this is this is how you encounter these events. Um, these might tell you, you know, they, these might reveal a new cover card if you're mm -hmm. doing your main story deck. Uh, otherwise, they might um, they might also trigger monsters starting to yep, lurk. Absolutely. So there are various things that can occur, but but what we really enjoyed about it is that each of us can have our own oh, response. Yeah. And there's oftentimes and, and you can even collectively work through some of the yes, consequences, which is also pretty unique. Yes, yes, very much so. And and sometimes there's clues in what is what what seems to be an arbitrary selection yeah. between them. Sometimes there's clues. You really in the have narrative. to pay attention. It's yeah. not just flavor text. There are really clues here. There are. So you really have to engage in the story. Yeah, Mark and I chose a good answer for we different, did. very different reasons. And Anne did not choose. No, she did not choose she wisely. Anne chose poorly. Yes. <laughs> Next up is the enemy alert phase. Now, this phase is specifically for those moments when no enemies have shown up from the event card. Yeah, so if you finish reading the event card, you say, yay, I'm off the hook, no enemies. Yeah, Not no, necessarily. necessarily. So what you're gonna do, it's pretty clever. You take a coin, you flip it, and if you get the bad side of the coin, then enemies are gonna show up. And it's gonna be a different amount of enemies based on the number of players in right. the game. The fourth phase of a round is the combat phase. During this round, if you have monsters out there, you will be performing combat. If you're mm -hmm. lucky enough not to have any monsters, you can skip this phase. But if you do, you'll first choose weapons with which you will be fighting these monsters, right. uh, and you will equip them. Uh, in the lower right of the weapons, you'll see how many hands they require. So you might be attacking with a two-handed weapon, maybe two right. one-handed weapons, or, or a shield and a one-handed mm -hmm. weapon. Uh, across the top is the name. You'll see characteristics of the weapons, which might give you additional attack value. And down here is a very key icon. It shows a number and the fist. And this shows your combat power right. for this weapon. Not to be confused with damage. Correct. Because your combat cards are going to dictate yes. that. Yes, and so that's very key. This indicates how many combat cards you can play of, of type 2. Indeed. Okay, during the uh, actual attack subphase. So there are seven sub-phases yeah. to the combat round. Seems it sounds like a super lot, combat, but it really, but once you not. get into it, it moves yeah. pretty quick. So the first thing you do is you equip these weapons. And then you draw combat cards from your deck of combat cards. You've got 30 here. Each player has a deck in his color. And you will draw, in the normal three to four player game, you'll draw five cards. Five to six players, you'll draw four cards. Uh, and the number of cards you draw is influenced by some other things. For yes. example, whether if you're overwhelmed, mm -hmm. you draw one less during this first round of combat. It's kind of like being stunned. Exactly. And yep. if you have initiative, you draw one additional one. You're an overachiever. You are indeed. <laughs> now these combat cards have uh, a name, an icon, and a number down here, yeah. uh, which represents their priority. Priority is one, two, or three, and mm -hmm. sometimes a blank as well. At the bottom, they represent the power they've got. So after you finish drawing these cards, you do have the option to pass on the combat and recuperate. You can discard cards and you pass on on attacking this time, but other players can still attack. Then for the players who are attacking, they play their priority one cards. Mm -hmm. Priority one cards are kind of a pre-attack phase. Each player can play one in no particular order, 
But these are things that might help other players right. uh, or yourself prepare yeah, for the attack. Someone might be able to draw extra combat yeah, cards yeah. or whatever. Right? And that's what this one says. You and one other player get to draw an additional combat card. So this might help you choose a better uh, card for the next round. Or the next, not round, but next subphase. After you've done your priority one cards, you do your priority two cards, which are kind of your official attack. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of priority two cards you can play are determined, again, by your combat power. And in this case, the Lance lets me uh, play two, two of, those cards. of those cards. And I've got a couple here, one which lets me place a damage token, and I would take yep. one of my damage tokens and put it on the selected monster. And that's kind of the most basic one. It's just yeah. a hit. Just a basic hit. Here's another one called Trick Attack, and it says I can spend one of, these, one of my energy spheres, yep. uh, and other people can... It, whenever, whenever there's an energy sphere, cost other players can contribute as well. But this one says, spend one to place a damage token. So I will spend one of my, uh, my tokens by decrementing my tokens on my board uh, to indicate I have one less, and I will place an additional damage token. Now, there are some cards which let you go beyond the combat power. Critical hit cards say ignore the combat power limit, mm -hmm. and this lets me place a third token out there. Which so, is pretty nice. And th this uh, subface has to be done in order from whoever the leader is mm -hmm. then around the table. So, And it's important to note that some of the weapons might have abilities that your cards will augment, so they might have right. like shock ability, right. which allows you to do more damage. Damage. Yeah, so there could be synergy between the combat cards and mm -hmm. the weapon itself. So after everybody has played their priority two, or what we call the attack cards, uh, it's time for the uh, priority three cards. And yeah, these, which are not always the best. No, thing. they're oftentimes not good. And these are kind of your post-attack cards, yeah. and they represent oftentimes damage encountered during your attacking the monster. Like they might have done a, a counter. And this hard counter says that, that when I attacked, the monster was able to do two damage back to me. Yes. And something we haven't talked about much are these tracks on the main board. Right. Uh, these represent your health and clarity for the entire group, yeah, not individuals. Collectively. Yeah, so it's yep. important that you maintain this for your group and uh, nobody should and be a hero Everybody's here. keeping an eye on Yes, they, yeah. they are. So in this case, it says I have to take, or we have to take two health damage unless I happen to be carrying a shield, in which case it's negated, which right. maybe I got lucky. Yeah. Uh, actually, we know with the lance, it's a two-handed weapon, so I didn't get lucky. It had to be decremented by two. Um, there are also these ones with a blank Ugh, here, which, which can only be, um, you can only get rid of this. This is something that just eats up space in yeah. your hand. It's a miss. It's just yeah. garbage in your hand. It is, yeah. but I can get rid of it by by recuperating and discarding this card. So that's the, uh, those are the three phases of the main attack. Right. Now, if any, oh, go ahead. I would say what's nice here is that they've really got a, a nice mechanism for stepping away from doing dice combat. Right, you know? right. So there's no, there's less, there's st still randomness in drawing, yeah, but you have is. a little more strategy. Yeah. Uh, and you can carry cards you didn't play over with you until future rounds. Mm -hmm. um, the next phase is if monsters are still alive out there, mm -hmm. they get to attack you. And you'll they see do. here at the bottom, uh, one we might have killed would say each player loses one uh, energy sphere. So if the thief had been left alive, we would all lost one. And this skeleton says uh, lose one hit point. Yep. So we you, you can be very strategic on which monsters you yeah. want to kill first. And then after that, there's the cleanup phase. Everybody uh, who's played um, played any any cards, combat cards this time around, uh, shuffles them back into their combat deck, and then you start a combat round over. Uh, by selecting weapons and drawing combat cards and so forth. And you keep doing that until all the monsters are dead. Okay, phase five is a reward phase. And the first thing you're going to do is check what level enemy it is. Is it green, blue, or red? And based on the enemy level, we'll determine how many energy spheres everyone gets. Mm -hmm. And it basically, for everyone who's done damage to enemies, you're going to get energy spheres. Right. And then you're going to determine the reward order. And basically, this is only takes effect if there's a loot icon on the particular creatures that were killed. And if there are, then you're going to take all the damage tokens for every player and stack them however tall they stack, yeah, right? Based on players. So yep. individual and then stacks. you can measure them out and see whoever did the most damage. And that player, whoever did the most damage, will get to be first in order when choosing loot. And the second highest stack gets to be second and so forth. Indeed. All right, then we're going to gain rewards. And what happens here is that even folks who didn't do damage to the creatures are still going to get a reward point just for being part of the battle, right, right. I guess. All right, so then everybody gets uh, treasure cards. And you're going to take a look at your treasure card, and then everybody gives the first player, who has the first player marker, gives 
the cards to that player. Yeah. So the card that you drew, you get to look at, but you yes. keep it secret from everybody else. And you, this isn't one you get to keep. You contribute no. it to the pile of loot. So you have some sense of what's in that pile of loot. Right. And you also then draw one additional mystery one yes. and put it in with that pile. And then the first player is going to show the first card and show it around and based on who had the, the done the most damage in, in the previous part of this, then you they get to pick first. Right. If they're going to spend their reward point to gain that treasure. Right, so whoever had the highest stack of damage, did the most damage, mm -hmm. will, get, will get to choose first. And if they want to spend their reward point, and you may have accumulated these throughout the yeah, game. You it, may have just said, I'm not gonna get anything yeah, this time. Yeah, you may yeah. not have needed a shield, everybody else needed a shield So in a previous round, so you might have more reward points than just yeah. this one. But then if you want this particular thing, if you have first choice, you could spend a reward point, mm -hmm. take that item. Uh, if you don't, you can pass. Yep. And then the second player in, in order gets and to do this and so on and so forth. Until all the treasure's gone. Exactly. And so by knowing what one of those treasures is, right. are, is you can say, you know, that's a great sword. But I know because I had it in my hand. The I know there's a better, better one. Sword. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So I'm going to pass on this one for now. People are going, are you insane? That's awesome. Well, it's not as awesome as no. the one coming up. Then finally, we move to the refresh phase. And there's several things you can do here. So first, there's the player's actions. You have uh, rest, which you can gain health. You can gain clarity. Mm -hmm. Then you have recharge, which gives you more energy spheres on your player board. And then you have search. And basically, you can look at the, uh, the tokens that are on the board. You grab the top one. And you get numerous things here. Yeah, and this is all when you do search. You're searching in the room in which your group, which is your currently group located. is currently right. located. Sorry, yes. And so basically, you're going to get like treasure. Your monsters could show up. You get health, clarity, and so forth. So there's a lot of different things that can happen. Here. There's even a little goblin. There's a little goblin, goblin guy, which, yeah. which will show up, and he's like a. He reminds me of a Ferengi. Actually. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but but anyway, he shows up, and you can buy and sell things. From yes. Him. Now, the fourth action you can select during this phase is sneak. And what this allows you to do is, as an individual, not as a group, but you can sneak oh, to yes. one of the adjacent rooms with a visible question mark. This means it has not been encountered right. and it doesn't have a clean token on it. Run off to the red ones. This isn't Yeah, no, that's, smart. that's yeah. probably a bad <laughs> idea. And this comes into play, I think, especially when you're talking about the exploration mode versus the story right. mode. Yeah. But it can be useful even during the story mode. What this allows you to do is you can spend one clarity to select a treasure from the deck of the uh, color corresponding with the question mark of the room you've snuck off to. Right. Uh, while you're there, you also can look at the top token, the search token, but you have to return it, but you, you, know, you don't activate it. You at least know what it is if, you're, if your party chooses mm -hmm. to go in there. And the last thing you do is you've got to check for an enemy alert. So while you've wandered off and snuck around and doing the pillaging... <laughs> this is the part. <laughs> yeah, this is the part. You then flip a coin to see whether you've alerted enemies. Well, if you, if you have, then you take uh, random enemies yep. from the pile and put them on top of the the, the deck corresponding with that color. So yep. if you're in a red room, you take a couple of uh, two or three red enemies and put them on top of this pile. Because now they're on high alert. Now, now, you do have an option, though. If you do trigger it, uh, or I should say this, yeah, if you do trigger them, you do have a, a fail-safe there. Mm -hmm. You yeah. can activate your invisibility. Spend yes. four of your uh, energy spheres and... Um, Nobody comes That's there. Right. But if you if you can't do that, you don't have the right equipment, you don't have enough energy spheres, uh, what you then have to do is put these here, and they're considered lurking enemies that are mm. triggered during the event phase when you draw a random event from that deck. So beware when you're sneaking around. There are great rewards, but there are great risks as well. So after each of the players have chosen one of those four actions, mm -hmm. rest, recharge, search, or sneak, they then have the option of disenchanting some of their weapons or equipment. Right. Uh, they can turn these uh, these items back into energy spheres. And the number they get is determined by the number in the upper left-hand corner, minus two. So in this case, these sneaking shoes have a value of 10 up here, and I can turn this into eight of these energy spheres and, and increment the number on my player map. After they all players have disenchanted all the items they want to do, the next thing you do is pass the leader marker, um, which is around here someplace. Yep. Uh, the leader marker uh, goes to the player on the leader current leader's left. You then check for clarity, and if you are down here uh, at zero, if clarity is down here, uh, then everybody's kind of in a bad state of mind, and health actually health detriments drops. as well. Yep. Okay, finally, the last thing you do is you clear the room, and you do this by taking the uh, one of these 
uh, clean markers yeah. and obscuring the question mark in that room to indicate you have encountered that room and the next time you're there you you have a more limited number of choices and one of the things phases you skip is you mm -hmm. not perform the event phase in that room again all right so we get to the end of the game and in story mode the way that's triggered is when you run out of the story cards now in exploration mode the way that ends is you run out of health that will trigger an end. You run out of enemies, that will trigger an end. Or if you hit 20 events, random events, that will trigger the game end as well. Now, keep in mind that these are all in conditions. They're not necessarily lose conditions. That's it's, right. It, just because you've run out of health doesn't mean you've lost. Because the way you determine the winner when you're in exploration mode, it is semi-cooperative, right. but ultimately whoever has the most data points wins. And the, right. the way you calculate data points is you get one data point for every five energy spheres mm -hmm. you have. Remember, you can disenchant items uh, for uh, the number in the upper left-hand yep. corner, minus two. And some of the monsters have trophies that translate into data points. So whoever uh, got those trophies adds that to their total. And whoever has the most data points wins the exploration mode. And if there's a tie, you can let the coin decide or you coin. can share the victory. All right, folks, just a reminder once again, this has been a Dice Tower paid preview. And everything you've seen here has been in prototype form. So some of the artwork and rules still might be in flux. Mm -hmm. So keep a close eye on the campaign for any changes. Now that said, you know, I really enjoyed the fact that this game has that choose your own adventure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's really well done how everybody can actually follow a different path. And then you all have to deal with the consequences, mm -hmm. which is pretty slick. One of the things we didn't really talk about, though, was the ever-evolving timelines. Yeah. And, and so, you can move between those timelines whenever you have enough points to do so. Right. So, uh, and sometimes the story may require you to do that. So right. the game comes with three different boards. Uh, there's the past, which is the green one. There's uh, a bluer one that represents the Ice Age yep. and one that looks like a bombed out future. And that's the apocalypse. Yeah, yes, that's indeed. right. So the way you move between them is you, you pay energy spheres equal to 10 times the number of players. Right. Which is a and, lot. And in that case, you basically would find your you would fold up the old board, uh, open the new board, uh, redistribute, redistribute all these search as evenly tokens. as possible. Yep, and then put your your group token in the same location there was before, and mm -hmm. remove all the clean tokens because you haven't encountered any of the rooms in the new right. timeline before. Yeah, you mentioned you like the uh, events in the story mm -hmm. deck. Yeah, um, I actually like. Part of that, the, the sense that there are clues built in. Right. And it almost reminds me, I don't know, I used to read Batman comic books, and every time the Riddler would, would pose a, a, some sort of dilemma to Batman, there were clues, clues built into yes. his words. Always. And I, I found that as well here is yeah. not only are there hints that you might get earlier, but even in the narrative for that particular card, yeah. you might be careful to analyze exactly what they're saying Absolutely. and make the best choice that way. I, I agree, because that's what's... A lot of games have just flavor story, right? This one you really have to pay attention yeah. because it yeah. really does have impacts on your choices. Right. So, anyway, folks, so if this looks like a game that might be of interest to you, I'm sure they'd appreciate your support. Definitely. And I think that's it from us. Yep. And until next time, we'll, we'll see, see you at the table. table. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.